Uh, thanks everyone for joining for uh, Water Talks. It's been a really long time since I've been on one of these, but uh, we're here today to talk about uh, InfoWorks ICM uh, and, and working with Optimizer. Uh, we've got uh, Tom Heidman here for uh, from Jacobs uh, to give a little background on, on some of the work they've done with ICM and Optimizer. Uh, also, Andrew Erickson here uh, uh, for um, the um, optimizer solution, uh, and then also print here for some backup on the on the Q and A. Um, I guess if you want to advance, Andrew. Yeah, so this is us. Uh, like I said, Andrew Erickson, uh, VP of Strategic Support for Optimatics. Uh, Time Heinemann for uh, Jacobs, being a product man program manager there, and then myself, Ryan Brown, uh, technical solutions engineer uh, here with Innovise now Autodesk. Uh, so it's a pretty simple uh, process here. If you haven't been to one of these before, uh, there is a Q&A and there is also a chat. Please just use the Q&A uh, to ask any questions. Uh, we will uh, try to get to the questions uh, throughout the uh, presentation. I'll try to monitor that and uh, interject when, when it seems appropriate to uh, add those in. Uh, this is a record webinar and you will uh, get a, if, if you did sign up and you weren't able to make it to this, then we will uh, send that out afterward to be able to uh, view it on demand. Uh, we've got a couple of other uh, water talks. Uh, these are every other uh, Tuesday, every other week uh, on Tuesday at 12 Eastern. Uh, next one we have coming up is just better understanding how your model works with uh, system and pump curves in InfoWater Pro. Um, we have a new product that came out recently, Info360 Plant. Uh, this is, quote unquote, what's going on inside the fence. Innovise has a long history of uh, analyzing things outside of the fence. Info360 Plant is really designed to uh, look at what's going on inside water and what wastewater treatment plants and uh, how they are uh, operating and then also some optimization going in there. Um, uh, we've got some... Uh, just a generalized uh, kind of uh, InfoWater Pro uh, looking at support. And then finally, at the end of the year, uh, closing out the year with the best and the brightest, uh, doing kind of an expanded case study look at uh, some of the, the highlighted uh, things that we have going on with our clients. Um, got uh, our first question in here. How long is this webinar? An hour? Yes, it's about an hour. Uh, if we get done early with all the Q&A, uh, we will... Uh, likely end early, but yes, hard stop at uh, at the top of the hour. So, with that, I'll uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Eric just to kick things off. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks, Ryan. Um, so, I'm I'm Andrew Erickson. I lead the strategic support team at Optimatics. Um, I've spent you know 10, 11 years now using um, InfoWorks CS and then ICM. Uh, I used to be a consultant um, about five years ago, and then I've spent the last five years with Optimatic. So I'm going to talk a little bit. It's going to be a pretty quick overview, but I'm going to talk a little bit about this software optimizer and specifically how it works together with ICM. So I just jotted down a couple of quick questions here that I hope you will have answered um, through this presentation, both my part and, and Tom's. So, you know, how can we uh, optimization help us get more from our existing hydraulic models? How can we use this tool to squeeze even more value out of our models? What kind of data do we need to be able to run an optimization? Specifically, how do Optimizer and ICM work together? very briefly just touch on a few different types. There's so many different types of applications, different types of projects you can use Optimizer on. We're gonna focus mostly on kind of CSO control um, projects here, and that's what Tom's gonna to talk about it. And then finally, probably the most important is, you know, what are the potential benefits for yourself as a modeler, as an engineer, you know, whether you work at a utility or a consulting company, you know, how is this gonna make your job easier? How can this help you do better work? But then ultimately, how can this provide value to the utilities that we work for? So really fast background here on the company Optimatics. Not going to go into detail on this, but just know that Optimatics has been around for quite a while, right? So we started in the mid-90s uh, connecting optimization you know, algorithms to water and wastewater networks. And for a long portion of our history, we kind of worked as a sort of specialty consulting firm. 
but we made a very deliberate shift almost 10 years ago now to becoming a true software company. So that's who we are today. We're a software company. We you know, partner with consultants. We work with utilities directly. We partner with Innovize, but we're here to get our software in the hands of other users, utility engineers, consultants, whoever it may be. More recently, we were acquired by uh, Suez. Not a huge difference to how we do our business and, and what we focus on, especially in North America, but that did provide us some connections into some really cool international opportunities uh, through the Suez network. So I'm just gonna start here with a little bit of a compare and contrast, kind of highlighting, you know, how would we go about a alternatives analysis, an optioneering effort, either just in our traditional approach versus with optimization, right? So let's say, this is gonna be a very simplified example, but I think it kind of helps illustrate that. So let's say that we've got a CSO uh, problem that we're trying to solve, right? We're trying to reduce CSO spills. We're trying to get to a you know percent capture or number of activations, whatever it may be. We can represent that CSO performance very simplistically here on this Y axis, where we've got lots of CSO up at the top and we're trying to get down as low as we can. We can also represent you know, the cost of any potential interventions, any strategies on the X axis there. And so what do we do as engineers and planners if we're tasked with solving this type of problem? We use the data, the tools that we have available, our engineering judgment to try to start coming up with different strategies. So I might take my model and plug in, okay, what if we upsize you know, this conveyance here? What if we add a new route of conveyance? What if we add pumping or storage or inflow reduction, green infrastructure? What about real-time controls? All these different possible options. I can start plugging into my model, running the simulation, figuring out the hydraulic performance, how well did it perform? And then eventually at some point, I'm gonna get some kind of cost estimate as well, right? So in this case, let's say we did that for five different solutions. And those five different solutions are represented by these five orange dots here. Some of them are better than others. Some of them are cheaper than others. You know, maybe this one in sort of the lower left-hand corner here, that's maybe one of the solutions I'm gonna move forward with, right? It meets my acceptable level and it's on the cheaper side. So we're going to be limited in the number of different strategies that we can look at just based on the time and the budget that we have available, right? So in this case, it's five, maybe for a big project, so it's 10 or 20 or even more. But at some point, we're gonna to have to stop. We're gonna to have to kind of put our pencils down and say, okay, that's the best that I can do. What we do with optimization is really very similar in a lot of respects. We're using the same models the same hydraulic models. We're using the same costing data. We're using the same hydraulic performance metrics or sort of standards, those targets we're trying to achieve. We're using the same types of alternative strategies, the conveyance, the pumping, the controls, inflow reduction, whatever it may be. We're using our same engineering judgment, but we, we kind of apply that in a slightly different way to run an optimization, which is a much broader a search through all these different possible combinations. And it kind of does the grunt work for us. And instead of me being limited to plug it in all these different options manually into my model, the optimization can do that very, very quickly based on the inputs and the direction that we give it. So what we get out of that is tens of thousands or sometimes hundreds of thousands of different solutions. Right, so we can kind of think of each dot on this plot as representing an entire unique ICM model, for example, with a certain set of strategies in place. So we get this cost benefit trade-off curve that's highlighted in green. And that really tells us a lot about the problem that we're trying to solve, a lot about our system. How much money are we going to have to spend to get to a certain level of performance? What's the best thing to do at a certain cost, right? So optimization is not necessarily giving us the single answer but it's giving us a range of potential answers that we as engineers can then go in and decide, you know what, okay, in this project, I just need the cheapest solution that gets to my minimum capture level. So I'm gonna pick that first point there that's below that dashed line. Or I might say, you know what, I'm gonna spend a little bit of extra money and go to maybe one or two points on the right there because I get another great 
return on my investment, I'm getting more CSO capture for just a little bit more money. So that's really, you know, any optimization or optimizer presentation, you're gonna see a lot of these curves. Tom's got plenty of them in his section of the presentation, but hopefully that kind of just sets the stage for what, what's actually behind this information that we're seeing in this cost benefit trade-off format. Kind of wrap up for like, why is optimization helpful? It lets us consider so many more potential options, many, many more than we would ever be able to do manually. We can run those tens of thousands, those hundreds of thousands of solutions on the cloud. So we have those high powered machines that we can churn through those simulations really quickly. But it's not just that we're running 100,000 simulations. Like that sounds impressive, but that on its own is not really the, the true value. The value is that we're using these algorithms to search through that solution space, all those different billions and trillions of different combinations and we're using it to evolve and get to the best possible strategies very quickly. And at the end of the day, optimization or optimizer is, is really just another tool in our toolkit that we can use to help make better decisions, right? So it, it provides a defensible, a repeatable, a transparent process for making these decisions. It is anything but a black box. You know, once you start using optimizer, working on these optimization problems, you're, you'll very quickly understand that. But it's just a tool to help us make better decisions. It can't do it on its own. It requires a lot of engineering judgment. It requires data going into it. But it can take that data. It can take those models. It can take your ideas and really kind of supercharge them and get some great results from it. So we always kind of break down you know, what, what do you need to be able to build one of these formulations? I think of it as these five different pieces of the puzzle that need to come together. And I'll kind of try to go through these pretty quick here. So, so Tom's got plenty of time. But the first thing is we need to know what the problem is that we're trying to solve, right? That's, it sounds pretty straightforward. A lot of times it is pretty easy, but we really need to nail that down up front. In that simple example I showed, we had two objectives. One was to minimize CSO. And the other one was to do that for the least cost possible. So easy, those are our objectives. Once we know what our objectives are, then we can ask ourselves, what kind of data do I need to bring in to solve that problem? The really nice thing here is that your hydraulic model, your ICM model is going to contain the vast majority of the data that you need to run the optimization. You, you will have to bring some other data sets in, especially something like costing data, right? That cost data isn't embedded in your, in your hydraulic model. So you need some planning level, you know, unit costs that you need to bring. In. Then you can start to figure out, okay, what are the options? This is what we call an optimizer decisions, right? So things like pipe sizing, new alignments, pumps, tanks, uh, control rules, inflow I and I reduction, green infrastructure, Whatever you can think of, whatever you think is appropriate, you can start plugging that into Optimizer to be considered in the mix. The next one is we need a way to quantify if those strategies, if those alternative decisions are doing a good job or not. So that's where we use what we call design criteria. But basically, these are things like hydraulic performance, you know, indicators, flooding, freeboard, surcharge, CSO volume, activations, velocity, most of these are going to come straight out of your hydraulic model. So it's very quick to set these up to kind of constrain the problem to say, this is what I'm trying to achieve in terms of hydraulic performance. And then what I think is the most exciting part is this last one. Once you've got these first four pieces of the puzzle already plugged in, then it becomes really quick to say, okay, let's run one optimization with this design event. Okay, another optimization with another event. What about an optimization for conditions as they stand today, as the network is today, versus you know, 10 year, 20 year growth projection? What about a scenario where you know, I'm not so confident in my green infrastructure costs? Those are a little bit hard to nail down sometimes. So I can turn that into a variable and run some scenarios where I assess the sensitivity of that cost to the types of solutions that I'm getting. So that's where you can get some real power out of the optimization. It's very, very quickly running all these different what if scenarios. So just a couple of slides here to finish up for my part, um, just to talk really quickly about how Optimizer and 
um, ICM specifically work together. So we've had a lot of um, great users in the US and abroad uh, using the Optimizer ICM integration. Uh, here's a few of, of some of the more recent uh, customers on this list. But, you know, I sort of broke it down in the seven steps for what do you need to actually do to connect the two softwares together and get them producing optimization results. The first thing is if you have an InfoWorks database, you can import that into Optimizer. Then once that's into Optimizer, you're basically pulling your model into Optimizer. You can start setting up those different formulation components, those five pieces that I just went over. So all your decisions, your costing, your design criteria, your scenarios, those can get all built up on your on the desktop software and optimizer. You can do some quick testing. You know, are things kind of generally working the way you'd expect? Is the costing right or the design criteria look appropriate? And then you can submit that formulation up to the cloud. And at any time during the run, you can check in on the results and review them on the cloud, or you can download them back locally to your machine. And once you get those results downloaded, you're definitely going to want to interrogate them, really dig into them, see what happened, see what you liked, see what you didn't like, maybe make a few tweaks. You might run a couple more optimizations, but at some point you're going to get some great solutions that you're happy with. And you're not just stuck with those solutions in Optimizer. You can export those solutions, those networks back into ICM as new networks in that original ICM database. So there's a good communication back and forth both ways between the two software, you know, really throughout this whole process. This is a really simple little schematic, but I think it kind of helps to just reiterate Optimizer is installed and used locally on your desktop. It communicates directly with ICM. This is all possible because of the exchange functionality that Innovise provides. Exchange is like a, it's an API. It's a way to programmatically um, interact with ICM. It's super powerful. You can do some really cool stuff with Exchange and ICM, even you know, aside from Optimizer, but that's really what a lot of this communication is built on. Then we push that run up over to the cloud where we've got a bank of licenses that Optimatics will manage for you um, that we can run all those ICM simulations up there on the cloud. So just to wrap up here, um, you know, Optimizer direct, directly integrates with ICM. Um, there's no messing around with a different version of your model or converting it or anything like that. Those two connect together. Um, it's a tool that helps us remove some of the grunt work from our trial and error processes. It's all about balancing these trade-offs. Cost versus hydraulic performance is, is the typical ones, but you're not limited to just those. You can come up with other objectives, other trade-offs that you might be interested in. And this little screenshot here, carbon emissions is one. Um, and then the last point I'll say here today is just that, you know, this, this helps us get to a more holistic planning process. Um, you can certainly save money on your solutions, right? It's typical to see, you know, maybe 20 to 30% cost savings, but it's not just about saving the money on the, the big capital infrastructure. It's also about coming up with a more defensible, repeatable way to go about the, these planning exercises and, you know, really get better hydraulic performance in the end as well. So I hope that kind of sets the stage for Tom's presentation here on the Omaha project. So I'll let you go ahead and take it away, Tom, and just call out when you want me to advance the slides. Okay, I will do that. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm Tom Heinemann uh, with Jacobs. I'm the uh, consultant program manager for the Omaha CSO program. Uh, I've been doing that since uh, 2006. Um, actually been with Jacobs for around 40 years, uh, but been working closely on the CSO program since 2006. Um, I'm going to give you about a 20 minute overview of our recent optimization effort there, which was successful in significantly reducing the total cost of the Omaha CSO program. Uh, the effort used both Optimizer and InfoWorks ICM as critical tools. Next slide, Andrew. So the yellow portion of this map represents Omaha's combined sewer system, which includes about 36 square miles in the eastern portion of the city along the Missouri River. Uh, the city's total wastewater service area is actually more than 300 square miles, 
but the combined sewer service area is the focus of the CSO program, of course. There are currently uh, 25 CSO outfalls, 17 of those discharged to the Missouri River along the east side of the combined system, and eight discharge into Papillion Creek tributaries along the west side. The optimization effort focused on what is what we refer to as the Missouri River watershed, which includes the 17 CSOs along the Missouri River. Prior to the start of the CSO program as shown here, this is referred to as 2002 conditions, about 8.2 billion gallons of combined sewage was believed to be generated in a typical year, 3.5 billion gallons of which was estimated to be discharged as combined sewer overflows. Next slide. Omaha's CSO program began in 2006 with the development of uh, the long-term control plan. Uh, the LTCP was submitted to the state in 2009 and CSO program projects started to be implemented immediately. Under the current consent order that the city has with the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy, the city needs to be finished with all CSO controls by 2037. Next slide. So the original 2009 long-term control plan was updated in 2014. The 2014 LTCP included plans for a variety of CSO controls, including sewer separation, treatment plan and conveyance improvements, high rate treatment and storage tanks. A significant component of the long-term control plan was the inclusion of a deep tunnel system which was envisioned to be the final control that would be constructed. The total estimated escalated cost of the program was $2.4 billion with the deep tunnel system estimated at about $560 million. Next slide. Key factor is that since the beginning, the city has focused on the presumption approach for regulatory compliance for CSO control. The presumption approach is one of the methods of compliance included in EPA's CSO control policy, but there are actually different ways to comply or to meet the presumption approach. In 2009, the long-term control plan took a conservative approach by planning for no more than four CSOs in any given year, which would have required that approximately 94% of annual wet weather volume be captured or eliminated. The 2014 update relaxed the strict compliance with four, C four overflows, but would have still ended up with around 94% volume capture. In 2021, in the update that we just recently did in 2021, we focused solely on the presumption approach requirement of 85% wet weather volume capture and, and not focusing on number of CSOs. The presumption approach will still be complied with, but in a less conservative manner. More knowledge, better tools, and water quality modeling indicate that this less conservative approach will provide for compliance with bacterial water quality standards. But the important thing is this, this evolution um, set the stage for the optimization effort in the Missouri River watershed. Next slide. So the goals of the optimization study was to use the optimization process and tools to identify the most cost-effective beneficial solution for removing or for, for uh, achieving the remaining CSO control. In particular, there was a desire to explore alternatives to the planned deep tunnel system using a no stones unturned approach. Was the deep tunnel system still the most cost effective approach or would a modified tunnel system or a non tunnel system be better in the long run? Next slide. This chart actually kind of jumps to the, to the conclusion to a certain extent. It shows that through August of this year, the city has spent or obligated about $991 million on the CSO program. If you look over to the right, through the optimization effort, the total estimated cost of the program was significantly reduced from $2.4 billion to $2 billion. So yes, we did find a more cost-effective approach through optimization. So how did we go about doing this? Next slide. <clears throat> this slide breaks the optimization process down into four stages. First, uh, define inputs, where we first identified alternative components. I'll talk more about that in a minute. We identified a proxy period, 
which was a period of storm events that served as a strong predictor of the full representative year of storms, we established a baseline ICM model, which was really a stream, a little bit of a streamlined version of our detailed InfoWorks ICM model. And we developed class five cost curves for the potential projects. The preliminary optimization stage was the most extensive modeling phase where more than 100,000 modeling runs were performed by optimizer linked to ICM. During final optimization, 30 what we refer to as solutions of interest were identified, which were ultimately reduced to five high-performing alternatives. The five high-performing alternatives were heavily vetted and ultimately a single alternative was chosen to include in the long-term control plan update. Uh, spoiler alert, the, the chosen alternative was one of the non-tunnel solutions. So let's get into a little bit more detail. Next slide. <clears throat> this slide emphasizes the four key areas of knowledge that are required for optimization. First of all, the model, uh, namely the InfoWorks ICM model, which was used to evaluate the effectiveness of solutions in terms of CSO volume reduction. Next, software. The optimization approach was powered by Optimizer, which linked the decision variables associated with each alternative component with the ICM model and summarized the CSO volume for each alternative evaluated along with the lifecycle cost. Optimizer is, as, as Andrew mentioned, is integrated with the Amazon cloud and leverages cloud computing to evaluate many, many alternatives in parallel and to systematically search for better and better alternatives to meet the objectives. Next, analytics. Results from the optimization runs were downloaded and extracted into Power BI and used to compare trends in alternative component selection, identifying which alternative components were most successful at cost effectively providing 85% wet weather capture or more. And finally, the team. Tools, of course, will only get you so far. A well-informed team is essential. Uh, numerous workshops and coordination calls were conducted over a year and a half optimization period to capture the knowledge of the program team, both city and consultant staffs. City staff reflecting both engineering and O&M perspectives were involved throughout the study, along with consultant technical resources with specialized understanding of hydraulic modeling, optimization, real-time controls, and wet weather treatment processes. Next slide. <clears throat> Regarding the ICM model of Omaha's collection system, we actually started developing it in 2003 with the city and have continued to improve it ever since. So we started developing the model actually before the official CSO program began. This slide shows how the number of nodes, pipes, and subcatchments have increased over time you can see that there was a significant increase between 2014 and 2021 when we did our latest update. <clears throat> and at this point, I wanna emphasize that one of our panelists today is Perrin Neiman, our hydraulics and modeling lead for the program. She's been working on the ICM model for the city since its beginning in 2003. So when we get into questions and answers, if, if there's any detailed questions about the ICM model, uh, she will be available to, to answer them. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that two optimization specialists, uh, Mason Thronberg and Anjali Chima, were instrumental in guiding us through the optimization effort. Uh, both Mason and Anjali were with Jacobs at the time, but now they're with, uh, with their new company by the name of Confluency. Uh, next slide. So this slide illustrates the Missouri River watershed with CSO volumes represented as various size circles or bubbles. Uh, the blue bubbles or circles is where we were at the start uh, in terms of the amount of CSO volume that was going out to the Missouri River. Orange represents the estimates of CSO volume when projects that were either completed or underway at the start of optimization, um, at the start of optimization are completed. We refer to this as the optimization baseline. And volume capture at that point was estimated to be around 71% wet weather volume capture. To get to 85% and above, the previous plan was to build, as I mentioned, the deep tunnel system. Optimization took a comprehensive look at other ways to get there. Um, another thing to note in this figure is that the larger CSOs are toward the north end of the combined sewer system. 
The deep tunnel concept was to collect CSOs all along the river and convey the combined sewage to the south end of the combined sewer system where they would be treated by a high rate treatment facility uh, called a retention treatment basin. This makes a lot of sense when you're controlling all CSOs to four overflows, but it makes a little less sense when focusing on volume capture rather than the number of overflows. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Alternative components or individual potential projects to reduce CSO volume were the building blocks of the optimization analysis. They needed to be feasible, geographically specific, and defined at a conceptual level to help reduce overflow volume. Optimization algorithms recombined these alternative components to define better and better uh, solutions. These alternative components were identified by the program team, starting with a, with a two-day workshop. They were added to the ICM model, which was then linked to Optimizer. Next slide. The one, these 117 alternative components summarized here by technology are a subset of the 150 that were originally identified um, following screening or for feasibility and potential effectiveness. As you can see, uh, categories for those uh, alternative components included active controls, conveyance, online and offline storage, treatment, tunnels, and so forth. And you can imagine how many different combinations you can come up with when you're looking at different ways to combine 117 alternative components. Next slide. The ICM model, project options, and performance criteria were used by Optimizer to execute over 100,000 model runs. So every dot that you see on the graph at the right plots an individual alternative. So in addition to using cloud computing, which is very valuable in terms of modeling capacity, a key factor in be, to be able to run so many model runs for Omaha was to shorten the time that it takes to complete each run. Using the proxy period that I mentioned previously for precipitation instead of the full representative year, and by doing a bit of streamlining of the, of the detailed ICM model, allowed run times to be shortened from over 30 hours per run when you do the full representative year uh, analysis to less than 20 minutes. You're not going to do 100,000 runs when it takes you know, hours to do a run. So we were able to, to, uh, to, to use some tools plus the cl cloud computing uh, to get those runs down to, to less than 20 minutes. Uh, less, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So optimization produces an enormous volume of output, um, quantifying performance for each alternative. Um, without assistance, interpreting this output can be a challenge, especially gaining broader insights and in how specific alternative components function together to capture wet weather flows. For Omaha, the concept of core strategies was used to help structure the optimization effort and understand broad uh, trends. The core strat strategies are shown here. Um, first of all, non-tunnel solutions, which had the greatest flexibility in their configuration because controls could be included at any outfall location. Um, the original deep tunnel system shown toward the bottom. And then a couple of variations called the short tunnel system and the collector tunnel system, which were really shorter versions of the, of the DTS. Um, the STS, CTS, and DTS all included a lift station and a high-rate treatment facility or a retention treatment basin at their downstream end as uh, part of their base configurations. Uh, and Andrew, if you could just click a couple of times here. As shown, in, uh, the non-tunnel solutions would require either two major facilities to achieve 85% volume capture or three facilities to get significantly better capture. Note that that uh, volume capture percentage increases as you go down the y-axis in this, in this figure. Short tunnel uh, solutions or alternatives would require only one additional major facility and collector tunnel and deep tunnel alternatives would not require anything more than just their base RTBs. So this way of looking at, at the system and looking at these core technologies really helped guide our way through the, the massive amount of information that was being generated here. The other thing that's interesting to note here is if you look at the graph on the right, tunnel alternatives, which are the, uh, the ones in the green and, and more the red, um, 
tended to be more cost effective at higher levels of capture. Again, lower to the lower right hand corner of this. This really supports the original selection of the deep tunnel system when we were being more conservative with our compliance approach. But you can see up at the 85% level, the non-tunnel solutions really started to rise to the, to the forefront. So this, again, this type of visualization was very valuable. Next slide. As the optimization effort went on, we identified 30 what we called solutions of interest. We defined them representing distinct CSO control strategies so that we could understand trade-offs in cost, performance, and other factors. These um, SOIs are shown here plotted across the solution space of a CSO versus lifecycle cost. It, it's very important to note that only a few of the solutions of interest lie along what we refer to, or I think Andrew mentioned the Pareto frontier, uh, which is uh, solutions along that lower left going from right to left that have minimum CSO vol volume at a given cost. So we didn't just pick the alternatives along that line. There were a number of reasons why we, we chose to look at a broader range, which the optimization approach and optimizer output allowed us to do. First of all, diversity of solutions. The alternatives that were along the Pareto frontier tended to be somewhat similar in their composition. Um, second of all, representatives from each core strategy. The city wanted to have a good understanding of how CSO benefits scaled with cost for each of uh, each core strategy. And finally, additional performance considerations. Volume capture and cost are certainly very important, but there are many other factors that contributed to the desirability of an alternative, including um, <clears throat> operability, resilience, proven technologies, performance under conditions of high river levels, flood risk reduction, community acceptance, water quality impacts, and so on. So we wanted to take a, a broad look across that solution space so that we could get a good idea of what we were doing. Um, next slide. <clears throat> the solutions of interest were, were um, organized into table format as shown here, so that the program team could, could take a close look and really you know, compare these against each other. Uh, ultimately, the program team provided input and actually did some scoring of the alternative of the uh, solutions of interest boiled things down to hot five high performing alternatives. Next slide. The five high performing alternatives are shown here. Uh, note that four of the five were actually non tunnel solutions. Uh, this table provided information on cost, percent capture, and type of control at each of the major CSO outfall numbers. Uh, the alternative, interestingly enough, the alternative that the city ultimately selected turned out to not be the least expensive one. Um, the least expensive one is shown here as NTS R3.1. The alternative that was selected um, was NTS R3.2, which replaces the deep tunnel system with a large retention treatment basin north of downtown and a large storage tank south of downtown. The lower cost alternatives were not selected by the city for several reasons, most of which are the most important of which um, they did not want two uh, remote additional remote treatment facilities, which was the case with NTS R3.1. Uh, you can see those at CSO 106, 107, and 109. They also did not want an extra storage tank at the south end of the system, which would have been the case at NTS R, uh, R3. Uh, ref 2. So we chose um, NTS R3.2 as being kind of the best overall you know, less expensive than the deep tunnel, but uh, kind of meeting uh, other uh, objectives. Uh, next slide. The identification of five HPAs was really the, the formal end of the optimization process, uh, kind of in the middle there. But after that, there was a lot of additional evaluation and significant effort to verify costs and concepts for the high performing alternatives. We also wanted to run them through the InfoWorks model with the full representative year uh, run so that we could make sure that we were getting reliable information. While some refinement was needed to the alternatives, uh, the performance costs and model runs using the proxy period and optimizer and, and the streamlined ICM turned out to be actually very good and very reliable. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Missouri River, um, this bubble chart shows um, 
the um, where the CSO volumes will be when 85% capture is achieved. Again, blue circles are the original and, and green is the ultimate. You can see how, how small the CSO bar volumes are compared to where we started. The gray circles represent volumes discharged after high rate treatment, including uh, disinfection. Um, the RTB was selected under optimization is the reason for the gray circle up at CSO 106, 107, you can see the, the large amount of treatment that's being provided there up north of downtown. And then the tank uh, was select, that, that was selected uh, impacts uh, CSO 109 a little bit toward the, toward the south. Uh, next slide. So really to, uh, to kind of wrap things up, optimization provided an excellent process for making informed decisions about Omaha's long-term control plan. It allowed a very large number of solutions to be evaluated and helped us narrow down to 30 solutions of interest and ultimately five high-performing alternatives. The final decision was made by the city and they have a high level of confidence in the results and a an appreciation for the reduction in program cost. Should also mention that the 2021 long-term control plan was reviewed and approved by the Nebraska Department of en Environment and Energy with no required modifications. We really kept them informed as we went through. And by the way, a rendering of the retention treatment basin is shown there in the Omaha, what we call the Northeast Omaha RTB is shown in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. Uh, final slide. There's some contact information. I might point out that the Omaha CSO website, omahacso.com is a great place to learn more about the program. Uh, a copy of the 2021 long-term control plan can actually be found there. So with that, I will um, stop the presentation and turn it back over to Ryan and others. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that presentation. That was uh, definitely interesting and good stuff. Um, we have one question from a while ago. Uh, Bill's asking, are there any plans to integrate Optimizer into InfoWater Pro? Not that I'm aware of. Andrew, are you aware of anything? Yeah, so we, we don't have an integration uh, with InfoWater directly. Uh, we do have an integration with WS Pro. That's, um, that's figured, yeah. less less commonly used in the U.S. now, but it certainly seems to be gaining some traction. It is quite easy, though, um, to go from InfoWater into a format that works in Optimizer. So many, many of our customers, um, Optimizer customers, have uh, InfoWater models on the clean water side. Uh, so that's definitely an option, but it's not a direct seamless integration like the yeah. ICM version is. Yep. Yeah, and, and for those not familiar, InfoWorks WS Pro is kind of the counterpart of ICM, and and would be able to leverage that that I exchange that we were uh, uh, that was kind of early on. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, got a second question from Mark Keen. Uh, how did you get the run times down? Good question, and um, I've I've talked a little bit about that. I might invite Perrin to. Uh, to talk about that question. Perrin, if you'd be willing to chime in on that. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? I've had some connectivity issues, so. Yep, good to okay. go. Um, yeah, so there were several different kinds of approaches used. Um, basically, one of the main things that has to be done is you have to skeletonize your model in most cases because most models are pretty detailed to start with. So figuring out which components are really essential to give you the kind of answer you want. Um, so we had a few different sizes of skeletonized models, which allowed us to kind of vet some of the solutions early on and then to build and go a little further upstream. So as you saw on the map, there's everything kind of flows towards the river. And so we were able to kind of truncate it. We called that the stick model. And then um, added detail as we went along as necessary. But the more that you can reduce, say, pump stations that are not really uh, doing a lot of hydraulic interaction, but just feeding a neighborhood into the system, maybe you can just feed that as a, a hydrograph and not have as many computations needing to be done, for example. So. I think we lost her lost a little her. bit there but um yeah i think what she was getting at was probably that you know skeletonizing is, is a huge component of being able to get things to run faster um icm is, is particularly good at 
at uh, churning through the the shallow water equations too. So, and then uh, uh, I'll just uh, I'll just reiterate too about the proxy period, uh, where I mean when we do a full you know a full full run, we will um, you know we'll do a whole we have a representative year which was actually turned out to be the 1969 year of precipitation in the Omaha area. We run the model through that entire year. And then, but what we did with the proxy period was we did a statistical analysis, actually Angeli uh, spearheaded this, to do a statistical analysis. And we picked a subset of storms that actually gave a very good correlation with the representative year. And just running those few storms in each of the runs actually shortened the runtime significantly. And as I mentioned at the very end, we, we vetted the, the alternatives with, um, um, with the full representative year and actually found very good agreement with, between what we did with the proxy and what we did with the representative year. So that, that was another yeah. key component. I would, I would say that that was really interesting to me too, Tom, you know, seeing how that proxy period was generated. It's, you know, like you said, you know, we don't want to run a year or 10 years or whatever it is for an extended period um, for these uh, optioneering simulations. But um, we've seen over the years, lots of different folks try to tackle that problem of, you know, I don't want to run a whole typical year, but I can't just pick one single event that is representative of all the CSO capture that's going to happen. So getting that right mix, you know, it's kind of a trade-off and it's not a hundred percent perfectly going to represent the whole typical year, but it gets you very close. And then the key is what you said there at the end, Tom, is you always can go back and validate against yeah. your full detailed model and against your full extended period. So you don't have to miss out on that validation at the end. And if you do that, if you identify that proxy period in a, in a thoughtful manner, uh, you know, then, um, you know, then at the end of the day, it should, it should agree with your full, your full year. And that's, and that's what we found. So. And there was, for those that are interested, there was a, a WEFTEC paper and presentation a couple of years back um, about that proxy period specifically. So some yeah, of the, the work made that a presentation, I think it was, was it 2019, I believe she did. She gave a, a WEFTEC tech talk specifically on that proxy period. That, that's right. So check that out if you're interested. Yeah. So we have a, a couple of questions that I think we've kind of started to answer or answered completely from Khalid, uh, Mark, and Katie. But um, just kind of, uh, you, you know, you, it, it sounds like we did run a full year. Um, and I guess just speaking, it's a 1969 storm, right? Uh, what what was the reasoning? Why was that the representative year? And then also just how um, how does that proxy period compare um, with which storms and what the typical year is and different things like that. Well, I wish, I wish that Perrin was not, oh, are you I, still I'm there, here if you can hear me. Yeah. Fan, okay. yep. Fantastic. Ooh, that's a great question for you, Perrin. Video. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the representative year was selected based also on a statistical analysis of, uh, of long-term rainfall records, just trying to pick a year that was pretty average in a lot of different ways. So number of storms, uh, the sizes of the storms, uh, the overall depth of, of precipitation and intensities and those kinds of things. So that was chosen early on in the long-term control plan development. And then we had um, the, the proxy period. I don't know if you guys said this when I was disconnected, but that it was, it was selected from some of the storms in the year. So they were not design storms, they were actual storms and it was a period. The statistical analysis used a whole bunch of different periods of, of varying lengths to figure out which set of storms would give uh, the closest correlation to the overall uh, re response from the year. So we were looking not at um, how similar the storms were, but how similar the behavior of the system was with respect to CSO volume. And so we found, I believe in um, the WEF tech paper that Angeli gave was, uh, it was, it was about a 5% error in the end um, in terms of the amount of CSO volume that was predicted by using the proxy compared to what the representative year said. So considering how much shorter it was, that's really amazing that it was that close. So I would never recommend that you don't vet your results, but once you've, uh, once you've done your optimization, vet them, but you can certainly use it and get pretty far with it. And uh, how long was that proxy period roughly compared to the full year? So 
it had, I think, a couple of uh, more major storm events. And there was actually, if you went time step by time step, there was a lot of dry periods in between. So we cut out the dry because we didn't, we just needed to let the first storm subside and the second storm start. So I think it was maybe on the order of two to three weeks that we trimmed down to uh, hours. I want to say it was maybe 30 or 40 hours of actual uh, rainfall input than when we ran it. So. so okay, I, th I think we got through some of those questions. It sounded like there was a, a good correlation between the proxy period and the uh, the full year. Um, so moving on to some of these other ones. Uh, Brian's asking, what's the general effort behind this kind of project for setting it up with OpenVisor? It sounds like it's a pretty streamlined process just with the exchange and everything, but uh, I'll let you, Andrew or Tom, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I can give my side of the story, and then I'm curious to hear what Tom and Perrin would say, but... Um, you know, we've done many hundreds of these projects and it's it's not a simple, you know, just one button click and you've magically got a whole formulation and it's all ready to go. You, you need to put some work into it, but I would say it's pretty similar to the amount of work that you would put into coming up with a solution, you know, just in a traditional manual approach. So it might save you a little bit of time. Uh, if it's the first time you've ever used Optimizer, it might, it might take a little bit longer than if you weren't, but uh, the the depth of the understanding, the results, the value that you get out of it will definitely help, uh, you know, justify that. But yeah, I don't know, Tom or Perrin, what, what were your guys' take? No, on I, I think effort? that's, a, Andrew, I think that's a good, a good answer. I mean, it, it, it depends. Um, I mean, the optimization process itself is very efficient. Um, we, uh, you know, ours, it took a, a, a fair amount of time overall, because, you know, we, we had a, you know, a program team that we wanted to make sure were involved in the process and kind of doing things in a stepwise manner. Plus, we were kind of doing it during the pandemic, which, <laughs> which made, made it a little bit interesting as well. But no, it's, um, and then a lot of the time actually also was, um, was that final vetting that we did. I mean, it was, it was a fairly efficient and quick, reasonably quick process to get to our five high performing alternatives, but then we did, a, a, as I mentioned earlier, a significant amount of vetting. We, we ran through the, you know, the full model and the full representative year. We did actually class four cost estimates for each of the alternatives to make sure that we were, you know, not getting fooled by anything. And, and again, we, we found that the, the correlation was, was very, very good. We looked at um, performance during high river levels and so on and so forth. So, it did take a, a fair amount of time to, to go through the process, but that's because we were just wanting to make sure that, you know, that we did, uh, you know, we, we came to the, the right solution. And, you know, at the end of the day, when reducing the estimated cost of the program by $400 million, I, the, I can guarantee you the city considers it time and money very well spent. Yeah, and I, I would just add that you know what once you know how to set up a, a storage tank for example then you can set several of them up in other locations and and you know it's you get over the learning curve and then you know how to set them up and one thing that's nice about this process is that you can be part way into it and at a workshop somebody has a, a brainstorm and says hey why didn't we look at this and you can insert a new kind of component or alternative into the solution set and still be able to get feedback from that. And so in most cases, you're not doing all the setup right at the beginning because you're still learning and asking questions and you're learning from the results and that makes you ask different questions. And so you change the overall approach. So um, there's kind of so a continual setup going on throughout as you're working through the results and, and really massaging the solution set to get to where you need to be. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to think about it. It's a, it's a process. It's not just a one press and you run one optimization and that's going to have all the results you need. It's an iterative, you know, it's a, it's a loop you go through. Um, but, you know, integrating that whole team, as, as Tom mentioned, is, I think, really important. In the and, and changing well. for the city to change from the, the deep tunnel system that had been had been the plan for 10 plus years. I mean, that was that was not something that they were going to do lightly. Right. So. You know, had to had to make sure that we were going through a a, a thoughtful process. 
Yeah, so uh, I guess just kind of moving on to the next question. I think we pretty much answered this, but uh, from Mark, did you combine all the storms into one run? It's, it, it sounds like it's my understanding. It's the year-long run is one, and then the proxy period, I'm guessing you use that to get kind of a ballpark uh, optimization. Yeah, so this the simulation still included a couple of storms, but it was a, it was a single simulation each time we ran the proxy period. Okay. Um, and then just talking about the skeletonization of the model, um, do you think there was anything missed in, in terms of being able to optimize the network because of that skeletonization? Or... Yeah, that's always the million dollar question, right? Uh, I would definitely recommend that you have a lot of people who know a lot about your system involved in setting it up, right? Getting the, um, the ideas put together and if you understand the way your system functions, then it's easier to understand whether it's going to be a big deal to cut out a particular component. But um, I'm an advocate for, you know, proving it when you can. So sensitivity analyses, you can run it once with and without and see if it makes a difference. Um, then you start to get a feel for it. So there's always the chance of missing something. And, and uh, you know, that's part of why we went back to vet the results at the end with our full representative year and full hydraulic model. And we did make some adjustments to the sizes. Um, it, there weren't major adjustments to the solution set, but there were adjustments to the sizes to make sure that everything was still going to achieve the 85% capture. So um, I think it's good to continue asking that question throughout the process because you can always influence the, the results if you're not careful. Yeah. yeah Karen, as I, as I recall, we did, um, as I recall, we did some vetting with uh, representative year and, and so forth uh, about halfway through the process, just to, just to kind of give it a quick yep. test at the end. Yep. Didn't make clear to the end. And I would say, you know, just as a general comment for optimizer analyses, um, you know, in a project like this, it definitely makes sense to, you know, if you can trim a little bit of that runtime down from skeletonizing your network, you know, there's upstream areas that are not as impactful for the CSO downstream along the river, then that's, that's definitely worth it. There's other types of applications where you just would, you wouldn't skeletonize any of your network and you would take your model as is and plug it straight into optimizer. It's really just about having a model that's fit for purpose. Um, so sometimes it's just your model right off the shelf is good to go. Other times like this, you'd say, you know, it could theoretically, you could load it into optimizer. You could try to run a whole, you know, massive you know, set of storms, but that's just not going to be practical. It's not going to give us the results we need at the pace that we want. So here's a few things that we can do to clean that up and get much quicker, much better results. So I just want to make sure it's clear. It's not required that you massively, you know, simplify your model to use optimization. It just depends on what type of project, what type of analysis you're trying to do. Just have a little bit of time left. We've got two questions to go. Hopefully we can squeeze them in here, but uh, this is pretty straightforward. Did you incorporate any kind of climate change or potential future uh, changes to rainfall patterns uh, with uh, selecting which option? I can take that. Um, we, we didn't look at that specifically with rainfall because we have a representative year that is agreed to that that's the basis of the, the plan and the design. But um, one of the, the big impacts that we've seen in Omaha in recent years is flooding on the Missouri River. And so that was very much a significant part of this. And as Tom talked about when we were considering whether a solution was, was valuable, we did think about how well is this gonna function in a high river scenario. And, and we've had in the last decade, we've had two years of very significant river levels that lasted three months or longer. And so um, th there's very much, you can incorporate those kinds of things into your process if you want to. Yeah. And then uh, lastly, we've got here um, something that might be outside of what you guys were looking at with Optimizer and what Optimizer can really do. But um, the, from Colin, uh, a um, typical strategy for a lot of CSO programs and things like that are to incorporate more ground infiltration stormwater systems to reduce the uh, you know, capacity uh, reliance on the combined system. Uh, was there any kind of green infrastructure, green streets that were tried to incorporate into this at all? Yeah, I can take that too. Yeah, um, there's, we, in, in most cases, 
small scale green infrastructure was not going to really be a, a needle mover in our case. And so we looked at the potential for reducing imperviousness on a larger basis. So we had a number of areas and looked at for a given subcatchment, if we reduce the imperviousness by 10% uh, or 25% or whatever, does that make a difference at the CSOs that we're looking at? And so we ran a very complicated analysis that involved lots of iterations on that. Great. All right. Well, uh, that's the end of the questions. And uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, Andrew, Tom, and uh, Perrin for um, sharing your insights. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll, um, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much. Appreciate it, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah.